But there was another parallel with the Murrell case. Before McRae died, his holiday home in Kinteo was broken into. The same thing had happened at Murrell's holiday home in Wales shortly before she was murdered. I don't think anything that mattered at all was taken. Willie did mention it to me because, again, he was quite gleeful o over it. He, his words to me were, they didn't get what they were looking for. After McRae's death, a society was set up to honour his name. Every year, they mount a memorial ceremony at a cairn erected in his honour. The society is led by an old friend of McRae's, Michael Strathairn. Was William McRae a man with enemies? All great people have enemies. Whether your name is Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Jean Jaurès or Christ, all great people have enemies. Uh, I should say the establishment in the country was an enemy of Willie McRae. Uh, there were uh, the drug dealers who had bases in his home territory up in the north west, and uh, he was on to them, uh, as, as they say. The northwest coast of Scotland was, and still is, one of the key drug routes into Britain. It's a multi million pound trade which some believe is linked to gun-running operations. A few months before he died, McRae had taken up the case of two Dorney men who, frustrated at what they saw as official inaction on widespread local drug peddling, had been involved in an incident with two local dealers. William McRae offered to invite uh, to represent us in court, and he was very pleased to do it, and he showed a great bit of interest. And the more the case went on, I got an impression that Willie was into something bigger. Do you think he could have been about to nail the big suppliers? Well, give me that impression, yes. Yeah. So McRae's anti-nuclear and anti-drug activities may have made him enemies, particularly if he had information on the suppliers. But there were other aspects of his work which would have made him unpopular in some quarters. William McRae had a long association with militant groupings within the nationalist movement. He was associated for a time with an early version of Shiel na Gael, or Seed of the Gael, which was later expelled from the SNP because of its militaristic style. It was at that time that McRae met two enthusiastic activists, Adam Busby and David Dinsmore. Both Busby and Dinsmore later became involved in paramilitary activity. In 1983, they fled to Dublin, where they were arrested on minor charges and held in Mountjoy jail. Britain attempted to extradite Busby and failed. Dinsmore, facing bombing charges, went on the run. Scottish Eye spoke to Adam Busby, a leading figure in the Scottish National Liberation Army. Was Willie McCrae involved in the SNLA? He was involved from February 1983 onwards. His first involvement was in the, in the attack, the letter bomb attack on the city chambers in Glasgow. This coincided with the, the visit of uh, Princess Diana and it, the letter bomb uh, exploded inside the city chambers and it cast a shadow over the royal visit. It was a great propaganda coup for us. What was his role? His role was fairly minor. He allowed us to use his office and uh, we were there on various mornings. We were trying to um, discover the, the times of various mail deliveries within Glasgow. We actually followed postmen and so forth. Coolport military base was the next target. Busby claims that McRae approached them with a proposal that they plant two unprimed bombs on approach roads used by nuclear convoys. The bombs, they weren't inert devices, they weren't hoaxes, they were actual bombs, but the timers weren't set because we didn't want the bombs to go off. We just wanted to um, draw people's attention to the fact that these convoys could be attacked and they were therefore a risk to the public. Did William McRae's involvement continue beyond that date? It did continue beyond that date. He was associated uh, with our escape from Scotland in 1983. He helped to plan the thing. It was very skillfully done, and he helped to finance it. He was no terrorist. He didn't need to use terror. He used the power of, of uh, his eloquence, the power of truth, uh, to know the man 
make the situation utterly laughable. W Willie actually was the kindest of people, and he was also a bit of a sucker. He, he couldn't refuse a plea for help. And at different levels, you know, sometimes it was just very ordinary things. But anybody who went to Willie McCray, um, no matter how misguided they might be, um, he would have helped them. Probably wouldn't have charged them, probably would have told them what fools they were and everything else, but he would have helped them. And I don't think there would ever have been any necessity for any involvement by, by him before he'd have helped them. That, that was just Willie. The fact remains that if McCrae was even suspected of being involved with SNLA activity, then he is certainly likely to have been under surveillance. In fact, there are suggestions he was watched long before any alleged involvement with the SNLA. That he, he knew he had been under surveillance, but he just didn't care, and he kept on doing his work. Dinsmore, too, has claimed McCrae was being watched. His words are read by an actor. I then left McCrae's office and saw a car which resembled one used by Special Branch in the immediate vicinity. It was a small, light blue car with a black vinyl top, a triumph, I believe, and contained two men who were obviously watching me. It was almost certainly the Special Branch vehicle BGS-425S. When I reached George Square with Adam, I spotted another Special Branch vehicle, a PSG-136X. Scottish Eye has investigated ownership of these cars. One was a blocked car on the police national computer, the other has a false number. In fact, we have established that both were special branch cars based in Strathclyde. Dinsmore went on to claim that McRae had also told him of being followed to his holiday home by a brown car, registration number XSJ432T. Scottish Eye has established that that car was a brown Chrysler owned and operated by the special branch in Strathclyde and later sold to a man in Telford. So was McRae followed on the day of his shooting? All we have to go on is what was found the next day and the official story. On the 11th of April, 1990, the new Lord Advocate, Lord Fraser of Carmyle, issued another statement deploring the continuing ill-founded speculation and discussion of increasingly fanciful and bizarre theories. He said that although two bullets had been fired, only one was found. McRae had died from a single gunshot wound and that the muzzle had been placed firmly against the skin. But there is some argument for the suicide theory. McRae was a brilliant, kind and passionate man, but he was also capable of deep depression. Another drink driving charge could have meant jail. He was also a supporter of EXIT, the Voluntary Euthanasia Society. Although seized on by some as proof of McRae's suicidal intentions, EXIT itself takes a different view. The circumstances rather suggest to me that he didn't commit suicide. A member of our society, if they did choose self-deliverance, would, I think, and from the information that we give them, would choose a, a method that's both peaceful uh, and also sure. I mean, using a .22 caliber gun, according to the experts, is a means which is more likely to inflict severe injury, but not kill oneself with. Um, I certainly can't see that as a rational person, which is the type of person that joins our society, he would choose such an unreliable and such a messy way of trying to kill himself. It makes no sense at all. <laughs> 